Yes. Okay, I think we have everyone then. Okay. So we are here to discuss the impacts of COVID-19 on education, not just um, as it relates to school specifically, but how it relates to the entire community when schools decide to change how we're doing things because of the pandemic, which is inevitable. Um, my name is Lily Rowe. I'm a Baltimore County Board of Education member for the sixth district. And I need to give my little disclaimer that I'm speaking only for myself, not for the full board. So any views that I express are strictly my own, um, but I am going to share certain experiences and things I have found in the community in my role as a Board of Education member. Um, we have with us Comptroller Peter Francho, who has always been an excellent advocate for education and has always used whatever bully pulpit he can manage to find, even if he has to construct it himself, to help the community find the needs of what we need from the state in order to progress. So Comptroller Francho, if you have remarks, please, sir. Lily, thank you. And thank you for your advocacy and being in the political arena. It's not easy these days. And um, let me just start by thanking all the teachers, administrators, school support staff, community advocates like you, who now, God bless you, are in elected office uh, for all your hard work uh, during the pandemic. I have to apologize on behalf of government because it's completely unnecessary. Everything we're going through could have been avoided and has been avoided in many developed countries around the world, but not here in the United States. Uh, everybody knows who reads the newspaper, I think understands that this is a devastating virus. When it affects people, it uh, can have completely mysterious as yet not understood uh, consequences. So to have that imposed on the school year is just particularly unfortunate. Uh, I think Baltimore County made exactly the right decision to say, look, we're gonna do this virtually, uh, not in person uh, until January, I think it is, or the end of January. That makes a lot of sense to me. What concerns me is all the political pressure for everybody to open things up despite that caution. And anyway, I applaud uh, Baltimore County. If I were a teacher in the system, I'd be particularly pleased that obviously they're interested in uh, protecting uh, teachers from being infected and employees of the school system from being inf uh, infected. And I just, you know, I go to the grocery store now and it's about all I do. It's the only place I spend money. And you know, I appreciate these clerks that are getting paid almost nothing and they're exposed to this virus. So, uh, you know, this this uh, issue of authorizing schools to begin in-person instruction, uh, I have a very positive relationship with Governor Hogan, but I think that was a huge politics-driven, not data-driven uh, situation. So, and this virus is no more can, uh, corral than uh, I'm a man on the moon. It is, spreading through our communities, it's going to come back, and we all know, during the flu season. And, uh, you know, so we uh, are engaged in a huge, huge medical experiment with our kids and our teachers and our all of the employees of the system. And I applaud Baltimore County, whoever made that decision, uh, did the right thing. And uh, I hope that the uh, rest of the state will pay attention closely, and I hope that the we're going to try to get the politics out of this. People, I see people on TV saying, looking in the microphone and saying to reporters, I'm not wearing a mask. I don't care. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I think the virus is a hoax. Okay, so having gotten that off my, off my mind, I guess, uh, I want to move on to the online learning, which everybody is trying to uh, adopt to these days. It's just made glaringly obvious this digital divide that we hear about. And um, when it comes to learning equipment, technology, and internet capacity, you know, so many students and families just don't have them at their disposal. So I'm very bothered by this 
so-called gap that separates affluent communities from those in poor, rural, and urban areas. Until we successfully address that very challenging issue, until we get serious about providing every child, family, school, and small business in our state with high-speed internet, we're gonna leave a whole generation behind. And all of that untapped intellectual potential that uh, we're just basically saying, uh, we're just gonna leave it on the table. So it's not an inexpensive uh, issue, uh, and I'm pretty tight with a dollar. I'd be interested to hear what everybody has to say about uh, internet connection that is required if we're gonna have uh, virtual remote learning. I mean, the idea that kids apparently are being driven to the parking lots of public schools uh, so that they can get a hotspot uh, in order to participate in class or do their homework, which apparently uh, is going on, is very troubling. Uh, connectivity, as it's called, everything to do with technology, most of which goes right over my head. Uh, right now, it's destiny for these young kids. And those who have it have a prohibitive advantage over those who don't. So we can no longer afford to maintain this piecemeal process of connecting Marylanders with high-speed internet. It just doesn't work. We must use all the tools at our disposal, statutory change, regulatory provisions, financial incentives to extend high-speed internet fiber to every Maryland home. We should eliminate restrictions for the state and counties to allow their respective rights of way to be used for broadband, which would make the process of securing the necessary approvals far less time consuming, cumbersome, and expensive. In a similar lane, we should require state and local governments to install empty conduits whenever they break ground for existing infrastructure repairs in order to allow internet service providers to lease the conduit from the government and provide access to underserved areas. I'd like to explore the potential benefit of tax subtraction modifications as a financial incentive for service providers to provide doorstep internet access within priority funding areas. And on that same front, I believe we should work with Maryland's real estate industry to identify residential and commercial markets that are undervalued because they're not connected. I even believe strongly that home builders should be required to install conduit in every new home they build to facilitate broadband expansion. As I said, connectivity is the destiny of our, so many of our kids. There are lots of other strategies that must be considered and implemented in order to attack and overcome the digital divide. I'll be talking more about these in coming months. The point is that it will demand a coordinated effort which blends legal, regulatory, and economic strategies and enlists state and local governments along with the private sector in this effort. I'll just close by saying this pandemic has challenged us in so many ways, but as Comptroller, I remain firmly committed to doing everything I can to help you and will fight for policies and resources that help in the short term and years from now. And by you, I mean Lily Rowe, because Try saying no to Lily Rowe sometimes when she's uh, in front of you arguing a case. She is a fabulous, wonderful citizen advocate. I know we're gonna get through all this because we have strong families, we have uh, wonderful kids and communities, and we have great ingenuity in our educational um, establishment. It's hidden and there are impediments that are put in the way, but everyone is going to have, I think, a tremendous opportunity uh, sooner rather than later to influence generations of future Maryland business owners and community leaders by getting this high-speed internet access for everyone in the state. Let me stop and because uh, I'd love to hear from everyone else on the panel and Willie, thank you for convening everything. It's exciting to think about a, a reinvented Maryland where everybody is connected. I think that is absolutely fabulous because we do know, especially in Baltimore County, where we have urban, suburban, and rural areas of the county, that there are some students who don't have easy access to the internet, either because they have no connectivity in the rural area they live, or they can't afford connectivity, or various reasons. Um, let me introduce the other panelists and then we'll move on to talk about some of those issues. So um, the first person I'd like to introduce is 
Belial Bahar, who we affectionately call Coach Belial. He is, uh, has started the Evolve Community Foundation, and I will let him give you a brief update of what he does in our community with his mentorship program for after school. You could you unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. I said thank you, Lily Rowe. Uh, thank you, Comptroller Franchos, and all the other guests, panelists. Uh, my name is Coach Bilal Bahar. I'm the founder and president of Evolve Community Foundation. Our mission is to create and preserve long term sustainable community wealth and a better quality of life for students, families, and stakeholders of the communities we serve. We do this by running after school programs, what we call our Beach Life Track to Success and Purpose System, it's our after school program where we do all our mentorship and engagement with the community. We also have a sustainable food production initiative through our Benji's Farm Project. And as you can see, I'm sitting in the Peace Pond Project, which is our therapeutic landscape initiative where we're trying to provide therapy and healing spaces for people in the community. And um, I'll let other, everybody else introduce themselves before Lily, before getting into what we're doing in regards to the conversation. Is that okay? Yes, that's great. Um, the next person I'd like to introduce is Mita Vogel. Mita is a social worker and is very in touch with the community and the needs of some of our students who suffer from poverty or are disenfranchised. Um, Mita, would you introduce yourself, please? So hi, I'm Mita Vogel. Um, I've been a social worker for 25 plus years. Um, have worked uh, a large part of my career in public child uh, welfare. Um, I also uh, have taught at the graduate and undergraduate level, um, and as well as have, wor have worked in forensics and adult mental illness and substance abuse and, and that type of thing. So I think uh, primarily bringing to the conversation the need to look at this from a systems perspective, which is sort of the theoretical foundation of uh, social work and how I see the world. So sort of how the various different systems are interfacing and interacting with each other. Uh, and sort of how that needs to get tuned up a bit in order to make sure that we're uh, effectively and expediently and thoroughly providing services, um, not only to our very neediest students, but also to our uh, students and families that are excelling because they're also suffering in the midst of all of this. Okay, and last but not least, Daya Webb is a special education and disabilities legislative advocate. So, Daya, would you please tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, Lily. Thanks again so much for having me on this panel. I feel like this is super uh, important and noteworthy. And, you know, during this time of unprecedented, I think that it's important that we have these kind of conversations. And I'm very grateful to Comptroller Francho for giving this platform for us as community advocates. Uh, you know, my background really is in uh, local advocacy, and I started working one on one with parents 10 years ago doing special ed uh, IEP type advocacy and then kind of branched out and started looking at working with initiatives that, for instance, uh, a piece of legislation uh, that was known as the hybrid school board bill that helped to make sure that our school board was comprised of partially elected members because we felt like that was very important for representation. So, you know, then moving beyond state level, started doing federal level advocacy uh, with uh, a couple groups and have found that when we're looking at disabilities in special education, um, the stories are varied, but I think the emotion is is really very much a connection because the emotions behind what we're doing with right now, like I said before, is not only unprecedented, but um, a lot of parents in special education are seeking resources. And uh, I think that this type of panel is perfect in discussing community partnerships and what kind of resources do we really need from the state in order to serve our kids with good quality. Thank you, Dea. 
Um, Ms. Johnson, who's the principal of Lock Raven Technical Academy, was supposed to be with us tonight, but she um, messaged me that she's not feeling well, and so she needs to take care of herself and feel better. So she won't be with us. I'll be addressing some of the issues that she was going to address. So let's start with our first topic, um, and we'll just kind of go around. If someone has something to say, um, we'll, you know, we'll try to, this whole Zoom thing and WebEx and virtual is kind of new. So let's try to focus on taking turns. Um, and if there's a delay, we might have to wait a second and not talk over each other. But so the first thing that we're going to discuss is the impact on teaching and learning and how teachers are handling virtual learning, challenges, advantages to virtual learning, and how minority students are impacted in, in, in different way from this virus than um, other students, because we know that they, minority students are infected at higher rates for various socioeconomic and health reasons, and in some cases, systemic racism um, in our structures as a society. So not passing any individual person, but in our structures as a society, the fact that these families are um, infected at greater rates means that um, their education is impacted and their ability to access that education is impacted at a greater rate. So I see we have people who are texting in different questions and I'm gonna to try to follow that. Um, Coach Belisle, why don't you go into, you've done some work in the community as far as transitioning your mentorship program so that you can help some of the families that are struggling to deal with virtual learning in your mentorship program. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? I mean, we did a couple of things. Um, before we got into virtual learning, we shifted to outdoor learning. And I think that was, that was just as important as virtual learning. And now what we're doing is just trying to coach a lot of our students on what those, um, learning those uh, learning management system platforms are all about and just helping them to understand that we're shift from uh, basic learning mode learning strategy now really understanding what these lms's are really all about how to navigate through them how to use them as an integral part of the learning system so what we're doing is we're having sessions on coaching them on how to communicate with the teachers, how to balance out time, really just trying to help them understand the new learning environment. It's just like um, we're just sort of the coaches to help them get through the manual to learn the new technology. And we've really just been focused on that aspect of it, trying to stay out, out of the way of the teachers, but really just support the students and support the teachers and support the schools to help them become better learners through these new technologies. Uh, whether I think now we're using Schoology, we're using BCP, BCPS1, and you have different uh, learning management systems. So that's really where we're focusing on is making sure they understand the learning environment so that they can ad adapt and adjust uh, to some of the achievement uh, gaps that may be present based on their situation. So I know many of the students that you work with already had, um, they were a little behind some of them and that you would after school do homework. And um, are you able to connect with those same students virtually to help them with the schoolwork virtually yeah. now that we're in a virtual system? Yeah, we are. We've been, we've been, uh, we've kind of been, like I said, supporting the school system and letting them get acclimated and kind of seeing where they are and studying some of the things that the, the county's doing, um, looking at some of our strategic partnerships with some of higher education, and really just looking to support um, those students. We've been engaged with them through Zoom and uh, FaceTime and all of the online or uh, technology that allows us to communicate. We've been doing some of those things. We're looking to recreate our program where we will do homework sessions, um, do our beach life training sessions and, and allow the kids to 
just have general conversation to help, again, coach them through this, this environment and this time we're in. Okay, I know one thing that we're dealing with in Baltimore County is providing hotspots to students who don't have Wi-Fi internet access in their home so that they don't have to sit in parking lots or that sort of thing. But in some cases, as the controller mentioned, we have students who are in places where even the hotspots won't work because even cell phones don't work. So the connectivity just isn't there. Do you have students, um, Belial or Amita, that you've had to help who don't have um, the ability to have any connectivity work because there is no connectivity in their area. Have, have, have any of you worked specifically with students who are in that situation? Um, no, we, I mean, we've been fortunate enough to, to be able to accommodate our students with our technology and our hotspots. Um, and we're mobilized to be able to help at a, 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 not a, a, a large number, but we are a few, not a few, few students at a time. We have the capacity to allow them to come to some of our locations and utilize our hotspots. So we haven't really ran into that problem where I am, but we're mobilized to support the school in any way in our after school programs if they need uh, students to be able to come to our centers and utilize our hotspots. But no, we haven't experienced any of that stuff, but we're prepared for it. Okay. Um, Comptroller, did you have something you were trying to say? I just wanted to uh, let you guys know that uh, at the end of this term, I'm not running for Comptroller again. I will have been Comptroller 16 years. I am going to run for governor. I'm going to win. And the group right here, Willie, you, Coach, Mita, Daya, Mrs. Johnson, when she feels better, you're going to be like an advisory group <laughs> for me where we're going to say, look, every kid in the state of Maryland deserves, regardless of their income, regardless of their zip code, a good teacher, a good facility, the kind of uh, access to technology which uh, kids need right now, or need even when school is being done in person. So anyway, you guys are going to be a very select group of advisors to me on how to make this uh, happen. It's, large, it's an almost overwhelming issue, the whole 5G connectivity, getting everybody access to hots, to uh, Wi-Fi, et cetera. That's a, that's, a, that's a huge issue. But you're going to help me, in addition to that, think about how we do teachers. How do we restore joy to teaching so that teachers are not uh, in these schools, very expert teachers, just droning through this curriculum that is imposed on them. And number two, we're going to figure out how to turn that curriculum inside out so it actually motivates the kids. And Coach spoke about bringing kids together and getting them to interact, and getting them mentored. You know, I'm interested in doing an experimental reconstruction of the whole K through 12 curriculum so that teachers are teaching, kids are learning through doing, and they're actually, at the end of the day, they have something uh, called uh, education and not just whatever it is right now, as far as I can tell, is just rote learning of whatever they think is gonna be delivered on a standardized test. So, uh, you know, better days are ahead, and you guys are far more experienced than I am with all of the issues that we're talking about tonight. But I can promise you that uh, we're going to do something very, and I don't want to say uh, disruptive. It is going to be disruptive. It's going to be incredibly experimental and innovative. Uh, reconstruction of the state's curriculum. And we're going to do higher ed also. For a lot of kids, college is really not helpful at all. I mean, they go to college for four years and it's the same, you know, they're basically doing it just to get a, get a degree. 
So I, I like what you guys represent, which is novel approaches to approaching the current system. So I need you to help me with that help with 5G, uh, you know, vision of everybody being connected. But most of all, I need you to pull the whole curriculum inside out and make it better for the kids and the teachers, not just the kids that are disadvantaged, the kids that are, you know, come from uh, neighborhoods that aren't properly served, but everybody, I'm talking about every kid in Maryland deserves a curriculum where when they come out of school, they are trained, they are educated, uh, they are doing things, and they are motivated. Right now, it's uh, for too many kids, the school is just, a, the curriculum is just a turnoff. Okay, I went off on a different tangent, Lily. I apologize for that, but I loved what everybody had to say about just uh, the perspectives that you have. And uh, I'm going to make make use of you guys if you're willing down the road. You don't even have to support me. You don't have to really even like me. But we're going to do interesting things that are experimental on. The Almost the FDR level when he was came in after the uh, right in the height of the depression. This pandemic is going to go on for three, four, five years. This is not a kind of oh, it's going to a miracle is going to happen and it's just going to disappear. It's a miracle. No, this unbelievable chaos that we have is not going to go away, and uh, so we're going to be testing uh, to pick a word. Uh, how we uh, change the change the current system, and not just go back. Thank you, sir. Um, Daya, Daya, what what kinds of things are you looking at and hearing from the disabilities and special education communities about how virtual learning and how the pandemic is impacting their ability to access services? Sure, and I think, you know, first I'd want to start off with saying, you know, we have 109,000 students with disabilities that we serve in Maryland. 109,000, so exponentially so with their families and who's impacted by uh, the way special education is delivered online right now. And one of the most important things and one of the most important points I've heard universally in every county is that there are some students that are just not able to be reached online as far as disability goes. So what that means is we've got a host of families who are basically living day to day with no idea how they're gonna get the supports and services that they once had for their kids. And they're really feeling alone. And so I, I love this policy uh, that we're talking about with Comptroller Francio about connections. I mentioned that before, but I have found that, you know, both the, the idea of connection when it comes to concrete connections, like an internet connection, and then the heart to heart connection and the policy connection needs to all be there when we look at educating students with disabilities. Um, I don't want to go off the rails, but I will say, um, you know, the federal statute demands a free and appropriate education for kids with disabilities. And uh, the, the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act also goes further to talk specifically about how special education will be delivered. So what that means is that um, basically the federal side of this has not fully funded IDEA ever. And so Maryland and Comptroller Fanshawe, you probably could back this up. Maryland as a state and the counties have had to basically pick up what's not been funded for appropriate education for kids with disabilities. And I feel like, um, you know, as we're changing and forward shifting, um, we'll be able to move towards policies and legislation that protect our kids and make sure that they have the appropriate services and education delivered to them. But I want to say again, not all kids can get an education online. So we need to be thinking as a state, how can we start to 
uh, really promote community partnerships so that we can bring outside service providers into the home. And what that means is are a host. I'm sorry. I thought someone was trying to talk. No, go ahead. There are very many um, nonprofit outside service providers that are serving students right now. Face to face, one on one, we need that. Um, I think that one of the other important points that we need is that parent training on IEP accommodations and modifications and how to handle their child's education at home needs to happen. Um, I'm pretty well prepared. I have a kid with a disability. I'm pretty well prepared. It's been very hard. I've not been able to work. We're living on one income. So what that looks like for other families could be catastrophic, honestly. You know, we're talking English as second language speakers having a very hard time trying to get their child educated uh, with a disability from home. And I, I think lastly, one of the most important things that I wanted to mention today that the community is saying is that we need appropriate budget allocation um, that reflects in the state enough staffing and increased funding for, you know, the fact that COVID-19 makes special education even more expensive to deliver. So, you know, at the end of the day, those are the solutions that uh, I've heard communities around Maryland discuss, and there is a lot, and I plan on following up with a group email to everyone on this panel. Thank you, Dea. Um, so, what I'd like to um, examine further is, we know that we already had an achievement gap um, in a lot of different schools and based on many different demographics so special education we have achievement gaps based on ra racial makeup we have achievement gaps um, based on socioeconomic status and so what i would like to examine is right now we're in virtual learning and some of those students cannot um, adequately access or engage because either they're going to work with their parents or they have family members who have and are recovering from COVID-19 or in some cases primary caretakers have become deceased from COVID-19 and I would like to know um, what you all think about once we resume in-person school and even now during virtual school what ideas do you have about how we can help those students? Who would like to go first? I, I would. I mean, I, okay, go ahead, well, Anita. I just sort of tend to be a cut to the chase type of person. Those of you that know me know that. And and I think the larger reality we have here is that we're trying to create this whole new idea of COVID-based education without really having a firm understanding of what the foundation were arising from anyways. So we're trying to create something new on a foundation that was not built to create this. And this is a fundamental issue here. So if we're looking at the regular schoolhouse and saying, well, we're not going to sort of mush this around and create this virtual learning environment, we don't even know how that's going to work for the most lush of our families. So the kids that have access to high speed internet, the kids that have access to their own laptops, the kids that have access, the parents that can be there all day and heard them through this process, we don't even know how it's gonna work for them. And nobody in the country does, quite honestly. We have small pockets of high end tutor programs that have worked for super rich families, and you know that's fine. But we don't even know how this is gonna work for the kids that have everything. So when we start saying, what are we going to do about the kids that don't have this? Or what are we going to do about the kids that, you know, have learning disabilities or other disabilities? And we've got kids that have profound disabilities on, you know, all the way, you know, that need ADLs taken care of and, and all of those things, all the way up to our sort of really high achieving GT kids that aren't getting services either. So part of my frustration and part of, of my, the way I think about things as a social worker is that it's not even clear to me that we have comprehensive assessment of what the situation is. So when we say things like there's a learning gap, 
we can't just say there's a learning gap because we're dealing with things like poverty. We're dealing with things like racism. We're dealing with things like completely underfunded schools. We're dealing with things like we don't have enough teachers. We're dealing with things like overcrowding. So to say that we have this, this learning gap, which of course we do, but then to say, and we're going to do X, Y, Z to fix it, to me is a bit of folly because we're sort of putting a lot of energy after things that we're not even sure what we're, we need to put energy after. So I would really encourage that while we're doing this virtual thing, focus on putting the fires out, the kids that just don't have access, the, you know, is there a way to get hybrid model in for some programs or some kids? I know other jurisdictions are doing that. But before we do any of that, we have to build on the foundation of making sure that our teachers are safe and making sure that the adults that are going to be doing anything hybrid are truly taken care of first. So if we can't even say the kids are going to be, you know, the teachers are going to be okay and the staff are going to be okay, then there's no way that we can even think about kids being okay. There's no way that we can look at hybrid anything. I want my kid, aside from everything else, I'm also the parent of a sophomore in high school you know, in Baltimore County. So I'm watching her sit downstairs on, you know, trying to do her work and she has everything she needs and it's still complicated. So I would really encourage us to not just say, let's figure out, we know all of these problems, but I don't necessarily know if I have a good foundation to say, this is how it is. Because every single system that we have that works for kids in this state is based on in-person interaction. Department of Social Services, Department of Juvenile Services, food stamps, WIC, school, everything, getting my registration for my car done. I mean, everything is based on in-person interaction. And so we really need to be thinking not only how are we putting the fires out that has to be put out now, and how are those systems doing that, but then what is this going to look like and what are the deficits being caused by now that we're going to start being addressing once we're back in place and i know that that's a huge statement but to me i don't have enough assessment information to be doing anything and i don't like building things on foundations of mud and sand and god only knows what else is in there so that's that's sort of me so one thing that was part of the reason why we pulled this together is the idea that we have different people from different groups that we can think through solutions from as a community, as families, as different members, leaders in the community. Um, and I understand what you're saying, Mita, because as a Board of Education member, I think what sometimes um, people don't understand is that in Baltimore County, even though all of the students had devices, all of the curriculum was still based on being in a classroom with the teacher using those devices. So to immediately switch to everyone is at home, now we have to configure every home network to operate with BCPS network. And, you know, that can be a problem when you have 115,000 students and a handful of tech support professionals, because previously the tech support was on our own network. Now it's on every home network. And so this, this entire delivery system of education feels like reinventing the wheel as we move along in an emergency situation. And so this is something I think it's gonna take the entire community to cooperate on, families trying to help each other, community leaders trying to help each other. Um, I know that one organization that I volunteer with, Student Support Network, has changed some of their model of operating facilities and rooms inside the school building for students to get material resources like food, a coat if you need a coat, a stick of deodorant if you need a stick of deodorant. They're now delivering outside the school buildings to people who drive up to students food that they need because we have serious food problems now that students aren't in school. And so I, I think that we need to, as a community and as a school system, be open to pulling more voices from the community in, more volunteers, more people, because we need creativity in this situation because there are no standard 
guidelines for how to do this because we've never done this before at any point in history. Um, Comptroller. Yes, thank you for that. Rita is far smarter than I am, and I think she laid out a lot of very important subjects, as did uh, everyone, Daya particularly. And uh, it just reminds me of uh, Daya of uh, years ago. I was friendly with Eunice Shriver, who's no longer with us, but Mrs. Shriver used to turn to me and just say all the time, "Peter, every kid is special and needs to be taken care of." So. Uh, this whole issue of disability is uh, something that should be front and center. But uh, let me just address Susan's question. I, sh I think they sent she sent a question in saying, uh, what is the confusion over the uh, Johns Hopkins positivity rate and the uh, and the positivity rate that the state of Maryland is using? Why do I bring that up? I bring it up because it's pretty clear that nothing that marches toward solution and progress is going to happen without the virus being corralled okay so the virus is alive and well in maryland communities but one side that wants to open up the schools and move forward with in-person stuff says oh we've got basically got it under control because the positivity rate is 3.7 percent it's under five percent we're following the data when in fact johns hopkins then says simultaneously no you're you're not uh, computing the positivity rate correctly. It's double what you just said. And I think Susan or someone who sent the question and was saying, geez, what's that all about? Well, what it's all about is the virus is going to make the decisions for us over the next year. And if we don't figure out how to get control of it, all of the remedies and solutions uh can be talked about but we're not going to be able to uh, make progress but once we have a medical solution uh after we've avoided putting our kids through and the teachers through a big medical experiment i would contend that there's lots of opportunity because it's going to be so volatile and chaotic people are not going to go back to where we were they're going to say no we're not going to put our kids on crowded buses we're not going to send our kids to cafeterias that are crowded. We're not going to have the same old, same old. So something will develop out of that that I think is, frankly, is going to be a better system of K through 12 education. And uh, I would encourage us all, at least you guys, to uh, you know think big as far as uh, what happens one or two years from now when we reconstruct not just education, but a lot of the sectors that uh, we're accustomed to in Maryland, which are going to be completely different. Who's going to get on the metro down in Mar in uh, D.C.? It, even with a vaccine, because apparently the vaccine can be authorized if it's only 50 percent effective. So 50 percent of the people who get vaccinated are still subject to this virus. <laughs> Long-winded way of saying they're not going to get on the metro even if they've been vaccinated. So I don't mean to be doom and gloom. I, ju I actually am very optimistic about from all of the chaos and volatility and the, and the you know, stuff that drives Coach crazy and, you know, makes me to just kind of throw her hands up in the air because there's, there's you know, it's just seems like we're building on sand. Yeah, we're going to go, we're going to strip things down and we're going to have a chance to reinvent some of these sectors, transit being one, environment being another, healthcare being a third one, that's going to be completely changed forever. And most importantly to me, education, because I frankly think the system doesn't work very well now, even when it's functioning more or less like the system uh, that we're accustomed to. I think it needs to get a whole new um, purpose. And once again, the bottom line should be every kid, regardless of where they come from, what their family uh, made in income, what their disability might be, every, every kid deserves a good teacher, a good classroom, good facility, safety, 
And uh, most of all, they deserve something that actually motivates them in school. And I guess you guys have more experience than I do with in-person classrooms in Maryland. Uh, my view is they're just not doing the job as far as producing the kinds of educated young people that we that we so desperately need. And uh, I don't mean to get on my ho high horse, but you asked me to come on the panel, Lily, so what the heck? I'm, I might as well put this stuff out because it's very frustrating for us now. We all want to like, hey, gosh, you know, uh, we need to take care of this. Well, we can't. We can't until the virus has made some decisions as to what it's going to do. And uh, hopefully uh, that will all be resolved with a, some kind of medical solution that actually uh, restores confidence in people. But boy, planning changes right now, other than as Peter was saying, putting out fires. I'm, I'm all for putting out fires. If any of you see something at the Board of Public Works that I can be uh, a champion for or a defender of, yeah, definitely let me know because, uh, but in the interim, boy, coach, I don't know if you're still out there, but maybe you can talk a little bit about yeah, uh, yeah. mentoring program and how kids actually get motivated and how sometimes other kids help kids get motivated and learn things. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think we, we have a really unique perspective, um, from a community standpoint, we started out in the community. We we started out literally working with young people in my backyard and just realizing that these kids needed mentorship, realizing that these kids needed some type of adult positive engagement. And the unique thing about that is, I wish uh, Principal Johnson was on the phone, is I went to Principal Johnson uh, several times and said, hey, listen, your students are in my backyard. Your students are in the community and we're engaging with them. I'm engaging with them. Our neighbors are engaging with them and we're asking them about school. We're asking them about their experience in school. And fortunately, they shared it with us. And fortunately, Stacy Johnson was open to this unique way of approaching. And that's we went into the school system and started working and we started realizing that there's a lot of work to be done so i think the unique perspective we have is we we're both in the community and in the school system at the same time which gives us a very unique perspective because most people are either there or there and because we're just kind of a bridge between the community and the school we have a very unique perspective we're very optimistic and I think it's important to know what our model is about. It's a coaching model. It's not a teaching model. We're not teachers. We're simply community people who want to coach our students on how to navigate through this K through 12 system, um, how to move from one level to the next and still be engaged with the community, knowing that one day you're going to be back in this community and we want to value you as a community asset. And that's what gives us a very unique perspective on how to approach this, because we see it as uh, John McKnight, uh, asset based community development. We're not looking at it so much as need based. We're looking at these are assets, our children, the individuals, labeled people. Uh, all of these people are assets to the community. And with the proper investment into those assets, we can move them to the other side of the balance sheet. So this takes us right into a concept that has been discussed in education for some time, which is the concept of community schools and the idea that in, in order for education to work, we have students who have basic needs that aren't met or they've experienced trauma. And so, in order for our schools to work, the students come to school, whoever they are, whatever they've experienced and whatever they're going through at that moment. And they're not always coming to school prepared to learn. And so I think one of the things that's been discussed in education circles, but that hasn't been discussed so much in government circles and as far as funding circles 
is having that approach to where, you know, we have social services that does one thing, Department of Juvenile Services, all these different things in different government organizations and volunteer organizations and community organizations that operate in silos. But the school system has an infrastructure to reach those students and reach those families. And the concept of community schools, which has been piloted in a couple schools in one in Baltimore City, a few around, if it's done right, it pulls all of those resources together to help the student so that the student can come to school available to learn, no matter what their circumstances at home. And maybe if some of you could comment on that, I'm sure that um, all, all, all of you have some ideas on this, but we really need the government to fund it. Go ahead, Dea. So as it relates to disabilities, you know, and, and the typical general education student as well, what you're talking about is trauma-informed curricula, right? So that is a specific current best practice that we need to have the state invest in for every school basically to be able to tap into this because this time has been traumatic. It's not only been traumatic for kids with disabilities and their families, but I think that re-entry into class time will require that very trauma informed approach. And I think that's really important. So thank you for mentioning that. We, we all, you know, that's what, we, as far as our mentoring strategy within our beach life curriculum, uh, beach life, standing for business, education, arts, community, and health. Social learning is an integral part of our delivery system. It's integral. I mean, we we don't separate the social emotional part of, of from our mentorship, from our tutoring. We do not separate it. The beach life is a whole concept. Education just being a portion of it. And we support what's happening in the schools from the universal learning systems for NGSS, all of the technical stuff that schools are doing, we get it, but we also understand the bigger picture, the, the uh, holistic approach to developing uh, students within the community, because regardless of what happens in the schoolhouses, the schoolhouses are in the communities. And it's our job to support both the schoolhouses and the students in our community, no matter what the platform is, no matter what's happening in society. It's our job and it's our responsibility. And we take it serious uh, at Evolve and we're here to serve, we're here to support communities. Lily, you know, uh, Mita, you know, we're, we're here and we're just ready to step up. And Coach, I, I think it's a really Coach tell topic. us, Coach, tell us um, what the Beach Life stands for because that's an acronym. People aren't familiar with it. They're not familiar with your organization. Coach, didn't you just oh. tell well, us what, the, what it stands for? Absolutely. Well, first of all, when you say the word beach, every, it puts a smile on everybody's face. Mm -hmm. I, I think just that the idea of beach uh, is, is puts a smile. But when you look deeper into what we develop, beach life stands for business. We want to make sure every one of our students understand the fundamental basics of business. Uh, education. We want students to understand the K through 12 system. We want them to understand the higher ed system. We want them to understand graduate and postgraduate systems. We want them to know the entire system of education. And that's the E. The A, arts. We want people to be able to express themselves through whatever means of artistic expression um, and community. Understand what community is about. Understand what asset based community development is about understanding what your role is as a student that we mentor, or we coach, we call them players. We want them to understand that they are an integral part of the community and we want them to understand they're an asset to the community. And then lastly, the H stands for health. We want people to understand the mental, physical, emotional health of the person. And we engage with our Beach Life players with the Beach Life philosophy in mind. And along with that philosophy is our guiding principles, which is seek perfection of character, be faithful, endeavor, respect others, and refrain from violent behavior. And as long as students from the community we serve understand our beach life and our principles, we're open to coaching them from K through 12 all the way to their doctorate degree. Awesome, thank you. So we're running uh, into almost the end of our time. Comptroller, do you have any final remarks? I hope everybody listened to what Coach just said, because 
Uh, th this is not a resource issue. I know you th everyone thinks it is, and we have to add more money here and add more money there. I completely agree with uh, uh, Mita and everybody and, and Daya, Daya particularly about the fact that uh, kids that are that are in need need extra resources. But the overall issue is not money. It's at it's treating these kids, each of them like an asset, as the coach was saying. And that's what's missing right now. I mean, it's like, I, I don't know, maybe I'm o overstating it, but uh, I hope everybody listened very closely to the acronym uh, BEACH because, uh, uh, Coach, you should be governor, not me. Because <laughs> no, I, I, you're, I, I you're on my, something. I stay in my lane. I stay in my lane. Yeah, well, you're, you're, you're talking to someone who is uh, – soaking up what you're saying and uh i just think it's what we need more of when we talk about connectivity we're not talking about just communication and rote memorization we're talking about everything you talked about and what everyone else feels which is communicating uh with these kids and every one of them is is your right every one of them uh is an asset it's just uh, tragic what uh, we're ending up with because we just don't realize that. And uh, so I, I just want to thank you and tell you how impressed I am with the acronym uh, BEACH. And you had some other acronym there that I'd love to get also, but that's what, <laughs> that's what Maryland needs. You know, we need a little less, uh, boy, let's go back and uh, put more funding into what we were already doing. No, we need to like reinvent ourselves. And uh, you, you're, uh, that, that was very influential with me. And seriously, everyone else, Lily, thank you for organizing this. If there's some way that we can get back together in a couple of months, I'd love that. But if I make it to the promised land, you guys are gonna be right there with me because uh, you know, it's too important to uh, just let things slide. Thank you very much. Lily, thank you for pulling people together. I happen to think this has been a very special gathering. Uh, other people may have different opinions, but that's me. Thank you guys. I, I think it's been very special too. And I wanna thank all of you for participating. And I've always believed firmly that government needs to be responsive to the community and that as an elected official myself, I want to hear from the community members because solutions to our problems exist in the community. And I would like to do some more of these types of conversations, but I don't want to keep people more than an hour because people are going from their dinner. So thank you all for participating. Thank you, Comptroller, for um, engaging this and always being the type of person that you are and willing to embrace uh, people in the community that no one's ever heard of and to elevate those voices to the highest levels of government. And I really appreciate that about you. Um, does anyone have anything brief and final to say before we let people get to their dinner? Yep. Be I got one. Be beach life. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, COVID. Okay, coach. I'll say this. Less COVID, more beach. I love that. <laughs> So true. There's something about wearing a mask on the beach, though, that's just not quite as much fun. But, you know, we built a fire pit in our backyard since <laughs> we have to do something outside, right? So, all right, everyone, good night. Thank you. Um, have a nice evening, and we'll look forward to doing this again sometime. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.